Hello everyone, my name is Bob Souza, speaking from the heart of Somerset Village, SATV9, and today my special guest, one of the all-time great athletes from Fall River, Massachusetts, Durfee High School Hall of Famer, class of 1957, Tom Aruda, professional baseball player par excellence. 1957, signed a contract with the New York Giants who were about to move to San Francisco to become the one of two teams out on the West Coast along with the Brooklyn Dodgers. They would become the San Francisco Giants and the Los Angeles Dodgers. It's a great honor and privilege to have Tom in studio with us today. Actually, he could go under the category of born too soon because there were only 200 jobs available for major league players in 1957. 25 players to a team, eight teams in the American League, eight teams in the National League. Today, that's increased by 350 more, so there are 750 eligible jobs in baseball today. Had Tom been playing when there were 30 teams, I sincerely believe he would have been a 15 to 20 game winner every year as a major leaguer. Then he always pitched nine innings, unless by agreement it was a seven inning game in the minor leagues. But today they only want you to pitch five innings, six innings, seven innings, they're ready to send you to the Hall of Fame. So with that introduction, it gives me great pleasure to present my guest and former teammate Tom Aruda. Tom, welcome to the studio. Glad to be here, Bobby. Anything you want, I'm here. Oh, one of the all-time greats. I wish to just get a little start, Tom, on your career from a book that came out in 1994 entitled Fall River Dreams. And this will take to the pro career. But before that, I have a picture here on screen of 1956 Fall River American Legion team, John Staff uh, Stafford Post, 314. We were eliminated by West Springfield in the playoffs. And during the playoffs, Tom, you pitched two no hitters, striking out a total of 36 guys in those two no hitters. And as we look at the team, uh, we have your battery mate, the late great Russ Gibson, who signed with the Red Sox mm. right after high school. Uh, to your left, you're in the back middle. You signed with the Giants, and I, I'm the next to you to your right. And then our great coaches, Brad McDermott, little left-hander who pitched for Providence College, and Charlie Carey, who signed with the St. Louis Cardinals, made it to double-A ball, until he had a broken leg in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. There were two great coaches to play for, and it was a great team. Your thoughts, Tom, on the summer of 56? I believe that was my second year in American Legion Ball, and Brad McDermott was a left-handed pitcher out of Providence College, and he did show me a few things about pitching, which to this day I still remember. Now, Charlie Kelly Kerry was a... Uh, Matter of fact, he was a great ball player, and he signed a professional contract. And uh, I, my buddy, Gibby, he used to watch Charlie hit all the time, and Charlie gave him a lot of pointers on hitting. They were two good guys that did a good job for American Legion. Yes. One of the reports, Tom, that we have, Fall yeah. River Even Series, Aruda strikes out 19. That was at Milford, second no-hitter. I believe you had one against Quincy before that. Uh, I think that's correct. Yeah. And there were 36 strikeouts you amassed. Uh, let's see, 19 in the second game, and the first one against uh, Quincy, 17. It started out as a twilight game, a 6 o'clock game, vicious yeah. thunderstorm, right. and the uh, game had to be halted for about an hour and a half, and then we went under the lights. It was a field that uh, was illuminated by the floodlights, and for nine innings you had a no-hitter, but the score was 3-3 because we made too many errors right behind yeah. you. Yeah, Plus it, was, some, it was in right field. It was a line drive that went through the right field. It was a love. And actually, I think they were ahead 3-0 right away. Mm -hmm. We caught up, and we uh, 
We ended up winning the game. What was ironic about that was about two weeks later, I came home one night and uh, the coach of Milford and his assistant was in my living room waiting for me. They wanted me to go to uh, uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania to be on their team. It was like a semi-pro team, which I did go. And we were out there for like 10 days and it was quite a few ball players. As a matter of fact, Al, Al Kaline was in that. He was playing at the time for uh, Baltimore, I think. Yeah. And you could tell he was a big league. He stuck out right away. Right. Never but, spent a day in the minors. Went from uh, that's right, yeah. the Sandlots right to the Tigers, mm -hmm. Major League. But that was uh, unbelievable performance on your part. Plus, you got to play left field when you didn't pitch. We only had two pitchers, you and Doug Baxendale. Right. Well, the, the, the last game, I played left field. But I had to come in in the ninth inning. I think I got one guy out, and then I went back to left field. And I think I threw out the tie and run at the plate to end the game. I wow. think. Yeah, I mean, right. that's a long time ago. That's right. That's <laughs> what happened. What a memory, folks. Well, yeah, what a memory. What a memory. Yeah. Now we go to Durfee High School. Wow. Our 1957 uh, yearbook picture, graduate of Durfee in 57. Where are you getting these pictures from? Oh, the research assistants, Laurie Belche and Jessica mm -hmm. Silva, are immense in their research. Yeah. Here we have the 56 team, I believe, Tom. I don't know. I can't no, see I'm a, uh, maybe not. This might be 57. I know you played on the state. Yeah, this is 57. 57. Al Atar was your captain in 56. 56. That's the year we, we won every. Won the state and the New Englands. Right. Okay, this is 57. I know this is Russ, the catcher from baseball. Right. Glory Andy days. Andrews right there. Okay. I'm going to put my glasses on. Right. Well, we're all <laughs> aging. I recognize Doug Baxendale, mm -hmm. Jerry Elias. They were both Legion baseball right. players. Mm -hmm. This looks like Manny Souza. It is. Okay. She uh, it is. All right. Now on the far side, Tom, the fellas closest to you in that picture. John we, Sheehan. We have you, John Sheehan, Jerry Elias. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, Russ also. What a crew, huh? What a crew. Looks like the Mox Brothers. <laughs> we won't comment on yeah. that. <laughs> All right, let's see. I, that's going to take us to uh, a story that was in the book by Fall River Dreams by Bill Reynolds, uh, talking about the great quest for Durfee High School under the great basketball coach Skip Garam, quest for a state title and a city's search for its soul. And there is a page dedicated to you, uh, page 199, uh, about a person from Fall River by the name of Tommy Aruda. Grew up below the hill, south end of Fall River, one of the greatest athletes Fall River's history. Talented guard on the All-State basketball team under Center Al Attar. In the late 50s, he was trailed by scouts everywhere and at times got to work out at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, Polo Grounds, home of the New York Giants, and the original Yankee Stadium in front of uh, the Yankee Scouts. Pitching on the sidelines, they evaluated his fastball, curveball, and changeup. He signed a contract with the New York Giants, who would within a month become the San Francisco Giants, and under their owner, Horace Stoneham, Tom signed for big money in those days, $4,000 bonus. And I tell the fans in the audience right now, through wise investment, Tom still has at least half that $4,000 check today. Three quarters. Three quarters. Tom, who was the scout for the New York Giants then? A guy named Tony Ravish. Tony Ravish. Who signed at the... Uh... Magoni's. Magoni's Magoni's rest. in a parking lot outside. And the place is still there today. Yeah. Maybe we could go down to Magoni's and reenact that scene. But it was outdoors. Outdoors. It was nighttime, too. Nighttime. Yeah, everybody would be in bed by now. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, first year, Tom, you were sent to Michigan City, Indiana. And at Michigan City, we get to see your first catcher, the man closest to you, Denny Summers who was from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and your first manager, Buddy Kerr, played six years for the New York Giants, 44 to uh, 1950, uh, as a shortstop, 
Pretty good glove man, maybe a 250 hitter. Yeah, good glove, no hit. Yeah, very good fielder. Uh, his last two years he spent with the Boston Braves, traded for uh, Eddie Stanky and, Alvin, and yeah. Alvin Dark, the double play combination, yeah. which the new giant manager, Leo DeRocha, wanted badly. Right. He sent Sid Gordon, power hitter, and uh, uh, Willard Marshall. Both those guys were good for 25, 30 home runs mm -hmm. a year. And of course, Buddy Kerr was a defensive shortstop mainly to fill in for Alvin Dark's departure. As far as Denny Summers is concerned, he ended up a baseball lifer, mm -hmm. uh, never really made it to the major leagues as a player. Scout, though. He was in scout, the league as a yeah, scout, yeah. Got a ring as the advanced scout in 1987 for Somerset uh, owned Greg Gagne, right. shortstop for the Twins. Mm -hmm. He was the advanced scout that year, and he scouted all the opposition teams that Minnesota would be playing. Mm -hmm. This photo shows him, 1987, working for Jack McKeon, who was then manager of the San Diego Padres. Mm -hmm. He also ended up with Russ Gibson in the, Russ's final years with the Giants. Nice, right. He was uh, in the Giant organization, right. public relations and scouting. I haven't seen him in years, but I did see Buddy Kerr because he came to Providence to, at a post Sox game a lot. And uh, he called me, and I'd go up there, and then we'd go out and eat after and uh, reminisce about old times. He was a great manager. He was a great guy. My first coach. He right. was my first coach, and uh, he passed away about a couple of years ago. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Close to 90 years of age. I yeah. remember reading in the yeah, obituary. He was from New Jersey. He was from New Jersey. Right. Mm -hmm. Now... Uh, uh, 57 or 58, Tom, or both years we were at Michigan. You graduate 58. 58. You didn't play at all after graduation in the professional no, ranks. I went to the beach with all the guys from high school. That was going to be a question, even though <laughs> that's not in the uh, uh, biography here. Okay, so it was 58 at Michigan City, the Whitecaps. Mm -hmm. Okay, Russ Gibson was at Waterloo. He signed in 57. He went to Lafayette. Then the following year, he played for Waterloo. And... We won the first half of the Midwest League, and he won the second half, and we participated against each other for the playoffs, and uh, they beat us 3-2. to two. Right. What, were you ordered by anyone to throw at Russ? <laughs> uh, no comment. No comment. No comment. Can't be hitting guys from Fall River. Right. You minor, know how they are. Minor league baseball was tough, though. They wanted right. to test the valor of the pitcher and the hitter. Uh, would Buddy Kerr be in that mode that he very, very definitely he was always on the field screaming he was like a regular he was like Earl Weaver okay. on the field a lot okay mm -hmm. and speaking of the Earl there he is there he is and this is I believe just as he's going to Baltimore this could have been the sixty seven or sixty eight season but he managed you in Rochester and what year would that be can you remember That's a good question I know. Um, when I was in the Eastern League, he was the manager of Elmira. Okay. And it seemed like all I had to do was show up, put my glove on the mound, and I could beat him. Right. He couldn't hit me. And uh, one day, I blew a lead in the ninth inning, but he came after me from the... It was a show. He was screaming at me. I started screaming back at him. He came like he was going to attack me and everything. I got thrown out of the game. He got thrown out of the game. We ended up in the stands watching the game, and then eventually he, uh, he got me on the team. He made a trade for me, and I did play for him for a couple of years. Wow, terrific. Mm -hmm. But at that time when you were opposed, uh, uh, an opponent of his, you were with Springfield, right? The Springfield Giants? Right. Okay, 1963, 4, and 5. Okay, those were good years. Mm. A golf pro and there we have the Springfield Giants now, 63, 64, 65, and you're highlighted in the front row. Do you remember the manager of the... Andy Gilbert. No, and Buddy Kerr was in 63. Andy Gilbert was 64 and 65. Okay. Long time uh, uh, people who were with Horace Stoneham. Mm -hmm. Stoneham always rewarded giant players. He kept them on the organization as managers, coaches, scouts. Yeah, mostly coaches, yeah. And, yeah. and managers in the minor league or coaches in the minor league. Right. If they liked you. Yes. Like anything else. Right. And uh, he was pretty good owner. He was sort of like a Tom Yorkie without money. Right. Cared about his people. 
when Dick O'Connell traded uh, Russ Gibson, uh, he asked him where he wanted to go. He said, hey, just find me a good spot. And he sent him to San Francisco. And of course, Stoneham was a great owner. So Russ was eligible for major league pension because he played three years there, mm. I believe 70, 71, 72. Well, when he, when, it's a good story. When, when Gibby got traded to San Francisco, he went, he showed up, and he, when he showed up in the clubhouse, there was a birthday going on, it was Gibby's birthday. So he figured, Jesus, what an organization this is. They're having a birthday party me first day here. May 6th. What he didn't know, what he didn't know, that was Willie Mays' birthday Willie also. Willie Mays' birthday. And it was, it was a party for him. Right, right. both my guys, May 6th, mm. Russ 39, uh, 1939, and Willie 1930. There's a story about you pitching to Willie, which I'm going to re <laughs> recite to you and the audience now because it's pretty good. All right, from Michigan City, Indiana, Tom, it's off to Fresno, California, Tacoma, Washington, later Oklahoma City, Springfield, Buffalo, Rochester, and God knows where else, Bill Reynolds wrote. Yeah, uh, gypsy, like a gypsy all over. Well, it says one famous bus ride took 42 hours between Texas and Veracruz, Mexico. Mexico. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, that's the hellhole of the world, Veracruz, Mexico. Forever and ever on that bus, it was a killer. You're right, it was 42 in the mountains and everything. We're lucky we came back alive. Let's see, we got one more line for you, Tom. In the Giants organization for eight years, then Houston for a year, then Baltimore. Along the way, your teammates, Juan Marichal, Gaylord Perry, Jim Palmer and the Baltimore organization. How about Willie McCovey? I don't know if he left. Did you play with McCovey? No, I didn't play against him. I pitched against him, but I didn't play against him. Okay. All right, then a famous game. Uh, pitching against uh, Willie Mays. The Giants. Yeah, you struck out 11 guys in five innings. Willie hit the ball halfway up the mountain. What happened there, I got to the ballpark, and Gaylord Perry was a teammate, and he was supposed to pitch that night against the Giants. And I just got out of the service, right? So they figured I was in shape, which I was in shape. And uh, he said, uh, you're going to start the game, go as far as you can, because Gaylord's sick, you start the game. I had a hell of a game. Matter of fact, I was ahead one nothing in the fifth inning, and Willie Mays was up. The first time he hit, he grounded out the shortstop. And uh, I got behind 3-1, and one, and if you know, Willie Mays had that brown Adirondack bat. And it, actually, I came with the pitch, and it was ball four, high and outside, but he went like that. The ball hit the bat and went to the right field in the mountain in Tacoma, Washington, where other people watch the game in the summertime. Nice to watch the game outside. But that's what happened to... He did have power to all fields. I would think so, yeah. He, he could hit that five, outside pitch to right field. He got 660 home runs, I would say so. And if he played his entire career in the polo grounds, oh, he'd probably uh, have 800. Uh, uh. <laughs> now, when you participated in tryouts in the polo grounds, uh, to pull the ball down the left field line or even swing late to right field, right. about 250 to 57 yeah. feet the one, most. One was 250, the other one was like 280 or something. But they had that double deck. Yeah, the overhang. Right. right. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. How about Ebbets Field? Did that field impress you at all? I can't, because I, I don't remember. The Yankee Stadium did, though. I yeah, Yankee Stadium. Yankee Stadium down the lines was short, right. but gigantic in the alley, especially left center. Well, the polo grounds, I got to hit with the pitches. I, we got there early, and the pitches were hitting, so I got to hit with the pitches. And I was putting them out in the, in the stands easy. Wow. The ball it was just a short porch. Yeah, but you you were really a pitcher, but also a skilled and proficient hitter. Yeah. Most pitchers would either just bunt or hopefully take t three swings and get out, mm. not get injured. Well, I played a lot of other positions when I was younger. Absolutely. Shortstop, third base, whatever. Right. And then, of course, the great years with the Legion, right. pitcher, mm. outfielder. Mm. Willie Mays uh, hit a home run in every inning of 16 different innings that he played, which means he had walk-off home runs, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, right hit a home run. run. The last one, the 16th inning home run to win a game, Tom, one nothing, 1963, you're in Springfield. He beat Warren Spawn, one nothing out at Candlestick. Spawn pitched all 16 innings for I Milwaukee. 
And it was Juan Marichal, yeah. your teammate, who pitched. Alvin Dock tried to get him out, maybe the 10th, the 11th inning, and he said, no way. He said, the guy's 42 years old <laughs> pitching against me. I'm about 25. I'm staying in. So Mays won it in the 16th. Right. But he had hit a home run in every inning of a game in which he participated prior to that. That's an amazing situation. It is, it is. Yeah. Tom, just going back to the Whitecaps again at Michigan City. 1959, a rookie catcher playing with Keokuk, Iowa. That would be a Cardinals team. The, the, uh, Johnson, uh, the Tim McCarver. Tim McCarver, yeah. Okay, you remember him. Right. Tim is now the analyst for Fox Sports. He was there as a rookie in that league. And the story about him was he had a confrontation with the plate umpire doing his first game as an umpire. Today, the guy has put in 40 years as a sportscaster himself. ESPN now, prior to that, ABC, CBS. Brent Musburger, He's NFL. Yeah, he was a rookie umpire, played umpire, when McCarver broke in 59, mm -hmm. but didn't have the umpiring, say, skills or politics to advance beyond that uh, situation. He was just minor league and then went into broadcasting. Mm. Tom, could you show us uh, the grip of the fastball curve changeup, which you employed for 10 successful years as a professional? Fastball with the seams. Right on this. top, okay. Right. Curveball with the seams. Actually the same thing, but I did have a good curveball because I have strong wrists and I did excel with my curveball. So if you had a good curveball, even if you didn't have a good fastball, it would look a lot quicker if you had a good curveball. That's that's about it. How about a changeup? Did you use that much? This of way. I used to do it this way. Oh, almost like a screwball. Right. Yeah. Right. Same motion. Yeah. Same motion. But that awful damage Never on the elbow. Never had a problem with that. Wow. No. Never a sore arm. No. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I thank you for that inside knowledge here. Tom, we still have a few moments left, and I want to take you back to the first time I ever saw you uh, perform in baseball, 1951, June 23rd. Fall River Nips, Somerset, one nothing. will host North Attleboro next Saturday. 900 people went to Pierce's Field, Somerset, uh, overlooking the Taunton River. Fall River's first Little League team played Somerset's first Little League team in 1951. Now, that was every single player in Fall River, one league, a, a tremendous team. Had a very good team. Almost won the state championship. Yeah, they, I think we got... Uh, you can speak to that if you wish. Well, I know it was like tight score. and we, we had runners on base the whole game. We couldn't get that run in. But the bottom of uh, the sixth inning, I think it was Lynn that beat us. I think it was Lynn that beat us, but uh, a guy named Omer Lavoie was the catcher. Later to play for Diamond right. in the Narragansett League, played against Somerset. Right. I remember going against a, him. We had a play at the plate that the runner was definitely thrown out, but they had pitches the following day that the plate was behind Omer, and Omer was tagging the guy here, but the plate was over there. The umpire called him safe. They walked off the field, and that was it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. Controversy. Oh, our manager, Shifty Shea, went out of his mind. With reason. Oh, I thought he was going to punch the umpire in the mouth. Wow. Mm. So the uh, young fellas from Somerset, of which I was one, had to consider ourselves fortunate to have lost on a Russ Gibson homer in the final inning, one nothing. That game, Russ pitched three innings, then went to first base, his arm stiffened right. up. Tom went from third to the mound, closed out the game. Uh, one strikeout, one walk. One of the few times in, that Tom did not strike out a man an inning throughout his uh, amateur career and professional career, he usually averaged a strikeout or more per inning. And one of the reasons he became a professional player. And uh, we were just lucky that game. But of course, he did get a double uh, in the game. Russ Gibson hit the home run. But it was a heck of a game. 900 fans uh, were at that game. Somerset put a fence up and a scoreboard for the game. 
but they had police in an area that the field was roped off so that you know the players would have room to catch foul pop-ups and stuff like that but it's a great memory so that was the first time I saw you and Russ and of course later the play with Russ in the summers of 54, 55 and 56 play with you the summers of 55 and 56 it was really a great honor to play with fellas who went on to become great professional players and in your case Tom I think definitely born too soon been a great major leaguer in today's standards and only asked to pitch five innings when you always went nine mm. I want to thank you very much for being our guest today here at Channel 9. I want to just want to say something about the Somerset game. The following year, I could play again in the Little League. Right. We were gone. Most of us were gone. But we did beat Somerset again at South Park, which uh, I think I hit two or three home runs and won the game in the last inning. But wow. they had Bridgman. Jimmy Bridgman, Bridgman yes. He was Went pitcher. to Colby, played football right. and baseball. We, we played them the following year and knocked them out again. This was like 9-8 or 8-7 that Right. Time. Okay. Yeah. I recall that. But yeah. in the first the first game, that was truly a classic one nothing yeah. game. Took an hour and ten minutes to play. Wow. Nine hundred fans, six uh, six umpires, classic. Well, folks, this has been a great privilege for me uh, to play uh, to be in studio with a former player and teammate of mine, Tom Aruda, who went above and beyond the call of all our local area ball players to sign a professional contract to play in the minor leagues and be extremely competitive for 10 years. It's been great, and we wish Tom all the best of health and wealth here as the years go by. Thank you very much for both Tom and myself. We'll be rounding third and heading home. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you.